So yesterday we have seen a lot about uh, DMA controller. So today let us see the DMA transfer. So in this DMA transfer also yesterday we have seen going to this uh, figure and uh, several things we discussed here. Several things we discussed means how this is uh, this bus read, control, write control, data bus, address bus. All these lines together is a memory bus. This memory bus, why we are calling memory bus? Because this is these wires are connected to this memory. That's why we are calling it a memory bus. Now what is that happening is this memory bus earlier it was having control by CPU only. That's why this IO device needs to directly communicate to the CPU or CPU has to check the whether IO device wants to communicate and then the CPU uh, uh, should this give this data if IO device wants. Uh, if IO device wants to write, then it has to facilitate even write facility. Who is doing all that? CPU. So now what we are doing is we are releasing from the job of controlling, uh, uh, I mean, uh, data transfer job from memory to I.O., I.O. to memory. So the releasing and giving the job to this DMA controller. That's why this DMA controller also has got read, write, address, data. All that are connected to memory uh, bus. Memory bus means all these signals connected are memory bus. So how is that happening and all? We have seen in a DMA uh, controller. Here this DMA, uh, where is that DMA controller? This one, DMA controller. Here we have seen, we uh, yesterday we discussed elaboratively what is that everything happening, why this address register, why this word count register, why control register, what is that request happening, what is that bus uh, request, bus land, why this interrupt is, everything yesterday we have seen. And those who want to revise, already recorded video, is there on YouTube video, kindly go and see this DMA controller now. Now today is uh, this one, that is DMA transfer. EMA transfer in this let us continue because already we seen the figure here. So now let us continue this. TPU communicates with DMA to the address and data buses as with any interface unit. This is the point number one under DMA transfer. CPU communicates with the DMA to the address and data buses as with any interface unit. This interface unit you have to recollect the very first figure where that uh, every I.O. device has got an interface unit through interface unit CPU was communicating through I.O. bus there. So likewise this CPU communicates with DMA to this address and data buses as with any interface. The way this communicates to the interface unit as shown in the earlier slides. Likewise this to DMA also is communicating through address and data. Very simple, not, not to, uh, there shouldn't be any confusion. So the DMA has its own address, which act activates the DS. DS means yesterday we have seen DMA select and register select lines. So through that, this is uh, DMA is addressed. The CPU initializes the DMA through the data bus. Once the DMA receives, start control command it can start the transfer between peripheral device and memory so after initializing what is initializing yesterday we have seen it under dma controller so once this initialization is done meaning if cpu has released the control of those memory bus of that memory bus so now what it does is finally after releasing the bus control the CPU, then it sends the final start control command to this DMA. DMA receives the start control command from the CPU. From there onwards, this DMA will form a communication between memory and I.O. device. When the peripheral device sends a DMA request, the DMA controller activates the BR line. You know BR line, the bus request line. So when peripheral device sends a DMA request, this one uh, we have seen somewhere here, this one, DMA request. Yesterday, uh, 
I pointed here this arrow should have been this arrow should have been the opposite way here because I/O device is requesting DMA, so that's why it should start from here and go to here this arrow. And once this is uh, this DMA is accepting this request, DMA will be conveying to this uh, I/O device through this signal that is DMA acknowledge meaning. This arrow, pointed arrow, should be here. This side. That that's the correction. Everyone make a note of this. So now that is the point here. Uh, somewhere we talk about. Here. So the start control and the BR. Uh, that is a bus request. This BR. So peripheral device sends a DMA request. The DMA controller activates the BR line, informing the CPU to release, relinquish the buses. The CPU responds with its DG line, that is bus grant line, informing the DMA that its buses are disabled. The DMA then puts the current value of its address register into the address bus initiates the read or write signal and sends a DMA acknowledge to the peripheral device. So this everything, just uh, now I have shown you, earlier on several times you have seen this one. If you have any queries, you can ask. Note that read and write lines in the DMA controller are bidirectional. This also we have seen, bidirectional there. The direction of transfer depends on the status of the BG line. Meaning, this if you see bus grant, when BG is zero, the read and write are input lines, allowing the CPU to, to communicate with the internal DMA registers. This DMA register uh, in inside DMA DMA there are registers. If CPU wants to check them, read them. And there is no bus request from the I/O device, so then definitely there will not be a bus grant to the DMA. So at that time, bus grant will be zero, and this read and write are input lines, allowing the CPU to communicate with the internal DMA registers. At this stage, when BG is zero, there is no I/O request. That is the point. That's why BG is zero. When BG is 1, meaning bus request took place from the I.O. device and the DMA has requested the CPU to grant the bus control, that's the reason why BG is 1. That is bus grant. The read and write are output lines from DMA controller to the random access memory to specify the read and write operation of the data. So this time, in this case, if you see read and write are input lines, but here if you see read and write are output lines, so they are going from from DMA controller to the random access memory. Earlier between CPU and DMA, there is no uh, point of uh, this random access memory, just because BG bus grant is zero. This bus grant is zero, it means there is no request from the uh, I/O device. That's why bus grant is not enabled. When bus grant is not enabled, who is having the control over the memory bus? CPU having the control over the memory bus. So that's why here BG is zero and read write in are input lines. They are behaving like input lines, allowing CPU to communicate with internal DMA registers. At this stage, why it is communicating to the DMA when the, there is no I/O request? Meaning. CPU sometimes wants to uh, check the DMA internal registers if there are any. For that reason, it may be, or simply it wants uh, uh, unless some data been kept and the bus uh, grant is made zero because this is a true interrupt. It might have acknowledged this DMA interrupt signal also you have seen in last session today yesterday session. So this DMA has might have communicated through interrupt to the CPU that it, it, there are no more to transfer uh, from the I/O. So the last one, possibly the left one in the DMA register, that CPU may wants to take. Uh, uh, take. That's why this this uh, CPU is communicating to the DMA, and DMA is not communicating to the random access node. 
these two are communicating. There is no picture of random access memory here. So sim simply in this case, BG is zero. The moment BG is becoming one, meaning bus grant, meaning bus request took place already from the IO device to the DMA. And DMA already requested to release, relinquish <coughs> that bus control, that memory control, memory, memory bus. So that bus request has done by the DMA controller already to, with the CPU. So CPU has sent a signal called BG, that is bus grant one. Since bus grant one is has come to the DMA, meaning CPU has released the uh, memory bus control. Who is having the control now? DMA is having the control over that memory bus. So meaning what? Now DMA can read from that memory that is random access memory, or DMA can write to random access memory. So me, reading or writing, now the signals are actually from the uh, DMA. They are going from the DMA. That's why this read and write are output lines from DMA. So when the peripheral device receives a DMA acknowledge, it puts a word in the data bus for write, or receives a word from the data bus for Read. This is very obvious. For read means it is reading from the random access memory, meaning it obviously receiving from the data bus. If it wants to write, that is, IO device wants to write, meaning it wants to put data where inside this random access memory. So th these things are uh, going to happen when the peripheral device receives DMA acknowledge. Maybe write operation may happen, or maybe read operation may happen. Only when DMA acknowledge signal happens being received by the IO device. Thus the DMA controls the read or write operations and supplies the address for the memory. So this is very quite obvious. It has been said already here. The same point here, different device. The peripheral unit can then communicate with memory through the data bus for direct transfer between the two units while CPU momentarily disabled. So this one also you have seen from this uh, figure with that. This one. In this figure now, this is the data bus. This one, you see the data bus. So once this DMA acknowledge uh, arrow is here, remember again, the arrow is not this side, arrow is this side. So when this DMA acknowledge has come, now this IO device can directly talk to this random access. At that point, who is not having control over this bus, these are the buses, data bus, address bus, write, control, put together, it's a memory bus. So this entire control is by DMA now. This CPU is not having any control over this uh, bus. That's the point. Okay. So that is the point here. If you see here, the peripheral unit uh, can then communicate with memory through the data bus for direct transfer between two units. While the CPU is momentarily disabled. So this is said in the last uh, session, uh, some uh, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, I guess, that taking the paint, if uh, it was doing a task one, then it, if the task one needs some some uh, data from the memory, then CPU cannot access that memory. So for that momentarily, this is disabled just because it cannot access that memory bus. Memory bus is controlled by another DMA. But if, if there are tasks, task 2 is there, which is not memory dependent, then CPU can attend that task. So that's the point. So for each word that is transferred, the DMA increments its address register, decrements its word count register. This has come yesterday. So I'm not going to uh, further discuss this point. If the word count doesn't reach zero, the DMA checks the request line coming from the peripheral. This also yesterday we have uh, discussed. There are three registers inside. One is the address register, the other is the word count register, the other, is the other is the control register. So when this word count is becoming zero, it means what there are no more that are coming from the IO device, peripheral device, uh, not coming or peripheral not required. So because it's a memory uh, communication, it, either it, peripheral wants to write to or read from. So that depends upon the word, word count here. If word count is zero, then no problem. But if it is not zero, then DMA checks the request line coming from the peripheral. Is that clear at this point? 
So for a high speed device, the line will deactivate as soon as the previous transfer is completed. There are high speed devices, then this is uh, without much waiting, this is uh, very quickly, this uh, request line is going to be active, so transfer will continue. But but what happens is uh, the second transfer is then initiated and the process continues until the entire block is transferred. This is related to the speed, speed high speed devices. But if the peripheral device is slower, the DMA request line may come somewhat later. This uh, slower and faster example, we took uh, some uh, two days ago or three days ago session, some uh, one eight bytes to transfer, some, uh, some time it will take, one byte to transfer, how much time it will take, then so much of time, that is 10,000 microseconds, I guess. It has to wait that CPU, sort of, sort of, same, same is applicable with DMA also. DMA, if a peripheral device is slower, then DMA obviously has to wait for the signal, for the request to come from the peripheral. So, in this case, the DMA disables the bus request. So, because the memory bus for a moment, for a moment, it can, it, it can disable bus request from the CPU, because CPU can hold, get hold of the memory bus, because this, this peripheral is slower. Since this peripheral is slower, we don't know how, at what time, again, the request may come to the DMA. Instead of waiting this DMA, what it does, it simply releases the bus control of that memory and it gives to the CPU. So CPU can continue to execute its program. When the peripheral request is a transfer, this peripheral request is coming to the DMA, it's slower case, then the DMA again, it can request. There, there is no uh, confusion here. Is that clear? If the word uh, count register reaches zero, the DMA stops any further transfer and removes its bus request. So, word count means uh, this, you know, yesterday we have seen uh, how much uh, 64 to 128. How many? Let us say 64. 64 to 128. 64, 64 words it has to transfer. Which one? Uh, peripheral device. So that count will be sitting in, into the word, uh, word count register. So the moment word count register is going to zero, it means what the peripheral has done with that uh, request. That's why DMA what it does, the moment word count becomes zero, it simply release, releases this, uh, this uh, control over that bus. So DMA stops any further transfer and removes its bus request. This bus request is going to the all the time to the CPU. CPU is granting the bus, bus request, BG. This is BR. So since not required anymore, so it stops the bus request, meaning that uh, bus grant BG will become zero. So at that time when BG has become zero, the control has gone to the CPU now. It also informs the CPU of the termination by means of an interrupt. Not only this bus request is removing, it is also through interrupt it is conveyed. When the CPU responds to the interrupt, it reads the content of the word count register. CPU also, apart from DMA reading this word count, CPU also reading. Extra care, this is extra care taken. The zero value of this register indicates that all words were transferred successfully. Earlier I was talking about when BG bus request is not going to uh, CPU, uh, this CPU will be sending BG zero. At that time, DM, uh, CPU will be reading DMA re uh, registers. So these sort of registers, at that time I was telling you, just today, in today's session, when we started just some, some time uh, ago. So why CPU reads DMA register? For this, for this reason it reads that when bus request is disabled, meaning now CPU will send BG0 and in, in addition bus request removed, CPU is also getting interrupt from the DMA telling that there are no more. So for that BG0, that is uh, but grant is zero, and then CPU also reading this word count register, which is there in the DMA. This is a part of the DMA register. Hope things are clear. This part, this part, when I was talking earlier here somewhere about BG zero, this one BG zero, read write uh, are input lines allowing the CPU to communicate with the internal DMA register. This part, this part has come here. This one, when the CPU responds to the interrupt, it reads the Contained of the word count uh, register. So the zero value of this register indicates that all words were transferred.
the CPU can read this register at any time to check the number of words already transferred. So this is also again not only a whether it's zero in between also sometimes we are checking whether all words are uh, it to transfer or uh, need, needs to be transferred. Uh, I mean needs to end the transfer. So for that this is checking. So uh, this is the conclusion I guess uh, DMA transfer yes. So a DMA controller may have more than one channel. DMA controller uh, may have more than one channel. In this case, each channel has a request and acknowledge pair of control signals, which are uh, connected to separate peripheral devices. Each channel also has its own address register and word count register within the DMA controller. This point uh, is uh, I don't know to how many it is, uh, uh, people have got this. This one, you have your, uh, this is your uh, DMA. So we have shown there uh, in uh, some figure, we have here uh, CPU and we have here RAM. Address line, uh, some data line, uh, address line and some, some other. Uh, read and write, all these together are uh, memory bus. So these bus, this one also having control, this one also having control over that, and that is your CPU. And this one is also having control over this process. ODM. Now in our presentation, what we said is one, one uh, IO device, uh, let us say, this is one channel. So this is a uh, CH1 channel 1. So channel 1 is requesting. Channel related to this channel 1, there will be three registers inside uh, uh, this DMA. One is the word count register, the other is uh, address register, the other is data register. So we have uh, word count register, data register, and address register. Related to all these are related to channel one. If there is another I/O device, there is another I/O device. So this is the channel two. Even this needs to request a DMA. So related to this channel two, we will be having all this set. This set, this this entire set, the entire set will be there even for channel 2. Likewise, you can assume here, channel 3, channel 4, like that. So that's what the point here, this this one. This one is, the DMA controller may have more than one channel. In this case, each channel has a request and acknowledge. Both are there. You have seen in the, the earlier figure, I would said that this arrow would have been the other side, so that that one. So this, each channel will have that one. Request of control, which are connected to a separate peripheral device. This separate peripheral, just now in paint we have shown. Each channel also has its own address register, or count register within the DMA controller. This also we have shown in the paint now, just while ago. A priority among uh, among the channels may be established so that. Channels with a high priority are serviced before channels with a lower priority. Now the issue comes when when these are there here. This, 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 here. Several channels are like that becoming here. This, there is another channel here. There is another channel means another I.O. device. So like that, there are several. So now who, who should be given the priority? You, this is, uh, uh, this may be given a uh, number one priority. And this may be given number uh, second priority. Likewise, this priority is uh, again the another issue again. So this we have to set. How do you manage this? The priority. How do you manage? Because it may be a simple uh, keyboard request, but it may be some fire engine alarm that is going to the DMA and the CPU uh, immediately should turn off some some temperature control something. Uh, this, this sort of request. So this is something uh, terrible. This needs to be controlled, otherwise uh, something, some blast may occur. CPU is uh, automated, 
the CPU is actually controlling that temperature and all. So it's just so programmed, it's automated. Automated. Every, uh, the, there is a form here. This form is automated and controlled uh, by this CPU. The temperature should not ex exceed uh, 60 degree Celsius. This this is giving the feedback temperature feedback to this, this uh, through this uh, I/O device to this DM. When temperature exceeds uh, the 60 degrees, the immediately this uh, this should be given a priority instead of a keyboard or uh, some other uh, you plug in device uh, something uh, uh, pen drive or camera. Instead of all this, this should be given the highest priority so that DMA can immediately uh, alert the CPU and uh, CPU can uh, immediately take some action. So such such things. So the, that is the priority set, uh, the setting. So that uh, that's the point here. And that question comes when the channels are increasing here. When channels are increasing, this priority issue will come into the picture. A priority among the channels may be established so that channels with high priority are serviced before channels with lower priority. DMA transfer is very useful in many applications. These are a few instead. It is used for fast transfer of information between magnetic disk and memory. It is also useful for updating the display in an interactive terminal. Typically, an image of the screen display of the terminal is kept in memory, which can be updated under program control. The contents of the memory can be transferred to the screen periodically by means of DMA transfer. So this DMA transfer related application, these are the few listed, but you have to remember uh, if, the, uh, if this is a part of the uh, DMA transfer, in the examination specifically, write about DMA trans uh, applications. Possibilities are there. Uh, question may come like that uh, for three marks or four marks like that. So in such cases, uh, if you remember this, and uh, so far what all we have discussed that uh, the DMA is uh, controlling the memory bus. That way, CPU is allowed to do some other tasks which are not memory dependent. That also I said orally. Do you remember? So such things as a as a part of DM applications we can write. So, but that is uh, possibilities are there. We cannot we cannot deny in external exam. Write about DM applications. So this figure you have seen. Uh, now comes into the picture another topic that is uh, input output processor. So how many are there? Uh, just some very few. If we go to this uh, IO input output processor examination point of view, this is also equally important. If you see the previous year question papers, write about the following. Uh, write about the uh, any two from the following. So among them, some three will be given. One is the DMA, one is IOP, the other is uh, maybe. Uh, handshaking protocol, something like that. So, among these uh, three, two you have to write. So, likewise, this is also uh, having uh, weight in examination point of view. So, uh, IO uh, processor, IO processor, that is input output processor. Instead of having each interface communicate in the CPU, a computer may incorporate one or more external processors and assign them the task of communicating directly with the all I.O. devices. This point is very straightforward. We have seen several times. The ultimate uh, goal is CPU needs to be allowed to do some computational task, rather data transfer jobs. This data as a part of uh, releasing CPU from the data transfer job, Earlier, seen that DMA itself is the one 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 example, one hardware that is. Other than that, DMA, there is something upgraded one called I/O processor. This is also doing the job of DMA only. DMA, what it is doing? DMA uh, releasing the CPU from the job of data transfer that is taking place from I/O to memory or memory to I/O. Who is doing that job? DMA was doing. So the same job now we are emphasizing with a bit bit upgraded job, bit bit upgraded hardware, <laughs> upgraded than DMA. That is I/O process. 
So this statement is telling that the same point that instead of having each interface communicate with CPU, a computer may incorporate one or more external processors and assign them the task of communicating directly with all I/O devices. And I/O P that is input of a processor may be classified as a processor with the direct memory access. EMA capability that communicates with I/O devices. Got this? The same thing again. The upgraded hardware I/O input/output processor may be classified as a processor with the DMA capability. So I/O P inside what is the DMA capability is there that communicates with I/O devices? Other than if, if DMA capability is there, then what additional I/O P may be having? That is the point to learn in this uh, topic. So that we'll see, uh, we will see shortly now. In this configuration, the computer system can be divided into memory unit and a number of processes comprised of the CPU and one or more IOPs. This you have seen in a, a previous picture: memory unit and your CPU and the DMA. You have seen where here is your processor this is your uh, memory unit and uh, this time this iop processor talking about instead of dma iop processor one or more iop processors in iop processor topic we are not talking about dma we are talking about iop processor and this iop processor is capable of having this dma uh, you know uh, uh, job D dma ability so meaning what in iop Say, say, let us say this is IOP. Inside this IOP, this, this hardware is also incorporated. If this is incorporated inside this IOP, what additional this IOP might have? Because what is the point of incorporating? That's the point that we are trying to explore in this topic. So, the point that I'm making here is, in this configuration, the computer system can be divided divided into memory unit. We have seen while ago just now. The number of processors comprised of CPU and one or more IOPs. Each IOP takes care of input and output tasks, relieving the CPU from housekeeping chores involved in IO transfers. This this chores can be uh, you know confusions can be avoided. What confusions? Housekeeping confusion. Who is uh, doing this housekeeping? Housekeeping means data transfer. Who is doing earlier CPU? So this can be avoided with the help of this IOP. Again, I am telling you uh, time and again. Earlier we were talking about DMA. Now we are talking about IOP. So what is the difference? Shortly will come. You know about the processor that communicates with the remote terminals over telephone and other communication media in a serial fashion is called data communication processor. There is a example just given for IOP processor. A processor that communicates with the remote terminals over telephone. See, currently I am communicating with you people possibly over telephone line. So, it's a remote. I am remote and there your terminal is also a remote. So, we, two remote terminals. Mine is a remote terminal and yours is a, their remote terminal. So, who is helping us to communicate over telephone line? There is a one hardware. That hardware is a communication media. How it is uh, allowing us to communicate in a serial fashion? My everything is going in a, not in parallel. What at all I am communicating going serially and there at your delivery point it is again parallel and converted to parallel. So serial fashion is called data communication process. It is there uh, with the um, my service provider, maybe my, my service provider idea uh, that BSNL. That fellow will have uh, there uh, somewhere nearer to my. Uh, Wires are going from my home to near, nearer to office, and nearer to office, so there are a lot of hardware involved in that office. So there, are some processors will be there. Similarly, your remote terminal may be communicating to Geo, uh, suppose Geo, some nearer there, some office will be there. So those office inside that office, if you ever go visit, there are a lot of hardware involved. So that hardware involved, one example is uh, this data communication processor is one hardware. So this is the sort of example for that. So now, the IOP is similar to the CPU, except that 
it is designed to handle the details of IO processing. So this CPU job is to compute and this job is to handle the IO processes. Unlike DMA controller that must be set up entirely by the CPU. Earlier, who was setting the DMA controller, that, that is a bus grant request is going from the DMA and uh, bus uh, request, bus request is the, we are going from the uh, DMA and the bus grant is coming from the CPU and CPU meanwhile uh, also checking that uh, registers of the uh, DMA that word count register is zero or not, sometimes CPU also checking. So meaning what CPU 100% is not relieved from this IO process. 95% might have been relieved from doing that IO processing task, CPU, 95%. But 5% still it is doing, like it has to uh, grant bus, uh, bus grant to the DMA and then interrupt comes from the DMA, <coughs> then it has to take over that bus, memory bus control. Such activity is still happening by the CPU. So the, uh, the point that uh, the uh, IOP is, to release hundred percent this CPU, how it is releasing and all that's uh, let us. See. So the IOP can fetch and execute its own instruction. That the this is the mechanism. How it is doing is this is provided with extra capability. Like the the way it is said, it is similar to CPU, except that it is designed to handle the IO process. So designed to handle IO processing means it is provided with extra features like it can fetch. It can execute its own instructions. So here in this case, what was happening in DMA case? DMA request was actually going to the CPU. CPU momentarily stopping the task it was doing, and it was uh, releasing that uh, bus control to the DMA. And DMA, when it is <coughs> starting uh, transfer of the data, once in a while, sometimes uh, according to the program uh, that is there. It is CP also checking the word count of the DMA whether it's completely zero, so that I can get hold of that uh, uh, memory bus. That 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 activity is still CPU is still doing. Maybe five percent it is doing, but it, it is doing. So, but the point here is this IOP processor is completely, uh, you know, independently it can make a decision without banking on the CPU. Now CPU will not bother about releasing the bus control and all. We see this IOP is just like a CPU, it is making a decision, it is having its own fetch and uh, execute its own instructions, the capability to handle this IO process. So at that time, uh, CPU will not play a role. So IOP instructions are spe specifically designed to facilitate IO transfers. So that is how this is planned. In addition, IOP can perform other processing tasks such as arithmetic, logic branching and code translation so these are these are the additional capabilities earlier so far i was telling what was the difference then if this iop is simply a, a, you know a, is, is also embedded with a dma simply embedded doesn't bring any special features to the iop so let us see in subsequent slides uh, what those special features are so those are the special features, special features are this iop can fetch and execute its own instruction point number one. These instructions are specifically designed to facilitate IO transfers. This is point number two. Point number three is IOP can perform other processes other than this IO transfers. It also can do arithmetic logic. The, the way CPU, as I said, I was telling you, it was the computation. Main intention is to compute. So the compute is this arithmetic logic. So that, those activities also this IOP can do. What the point? So, the block diagram of a uh, uh, computer with a two processes is shown here in the figure six. Let us see what is the figure six. This is figure six. You see the figure six. This is a memory bus. This memory bus is, you see the two arrows here. Your CPU is also communicating to the memory bus. Your IOP is just like CPU, it is also communicating to the memory. Just like. But all these uh, peripheral devices, PD, peripheral devices are connected to this IO. Uh, this IO. So then you may have a doubt then uh, when CPU is actually accessing this bus, 
how is that possible for IOP to access this bus? The time management, there are a lot many things to learn, but it's not part of the syllabus. Say, uh, time division multiplexing or something you might have heard like that. The time based, like, uh, you know, this census, if bus is free, then, uh, then it will access. If bus is busy with CPU, then for a while it possibly may delay. So that thing still happens, but CPU will not involve here now. CPU, this CPU will not involve, uh, like DMA it was involving, no. It is taking a request actually uh, from the, let us say this is DMA. What was happening? It is uh, requesting uh, here uh, to the, uh, through that uh, what's called uh, BR bus request. Then CPU is uh, we are communicating this uh, DMA through BG uh, bus grant, and then once uh, this I uh, this is acknowledging the devices here. Once this uh, uh, here registers are there inside address register, that uh, word count register, and uh, some some register. What is that? Uh, control register. CPU also checking here. So CPU involvement was there in the DMA, but here now CPU involvement will not be there. Independently, this IOP is making a decision, everything, like uh, this is requesting some memory uh, here, 64 to 128, this is so capable that it, without this uh, asking the CPU, this IOP makes a decision, it goes there, 64 to 128, it accesses the block completely, whichever device it is asking, it will give it to that. If it wants to write uh, 64 to 128 for the, uh, location, then uh, without asking CPU, it can go here and it can write. The only point here to understand is, this, this glitch, the glitch is at the time when CPU accessing the, this bus, can this write, can this write or read, that's the glitch. So this glitch is handled through time mechanism, time-based mechanism. Like, uh, you know, for one nanosecond this one and the other nanosecond this one, like that they keep communicating. That glitch is still there. So in the future you can work at uh, your uh, project and you, that glitch you can avoid and you can present a paper in the IEEE uh, journal. So that is uh, really seriously I'm talking. So that is there uh, still. So there we are. Uh, over here. Uh, figure six. The memory unit occupies the central position and can communicate with each processor by means of direct memory access. The memory unit occupies central, uh, central position and can communicate with each processor by means of direct memory and this, this direct memory access is there in the IOP now. The CPU is responsible for processing data needed in the solution of computational tasks. This is uh, known to you. The IOP provides a path uh, for transfer of data between various peripheral devices and memory. This is also known to you. Just now we have seen. The CPU is usually assigned the task of initiating the IO pro, uh, program input output. This is the uh, this is uh, this is something uh, that we are uh, uh, we did not talk uh, while we had gone to this figure six. CPU uh, usually this time management. Oh yeah, we we talked about this. CPU, what is that happening? CPU is usually assigned the task of initiating the I/O program. If there is the I/O program input output program, I mean uh, this one. Let me go here. This one. CPU is generally initializes means if if there is a, a query here. So this why uh, this this, this uh, peripheral device is uh, trying to access this uh, memory. This CPU has the authority. This about, uh, about the glitch I talked about the glitch. So that glitch like how to uh, uh, who should go uh, first here to access this one, and uh, who whether this to be permitted first to go and access and then it can postpone for a while. This glitch this this, this access bus. So that is that decision making is. Uh, left with the CPU. So that is what the point is. This one. The CPU is usually assigned the task of initiating the IOP. From then on, IOP operates independent of the CPU and continues to transfer data from external devices and memory. So now the data formats of peripheral devices differ from memory and CPU data format. This long ago we have seen when the first figure each interface has, uh, uh, you know, every I/O device has got an interface unit. Why? Because data formats are differing. So this is the same point. This one. If you have any queries, you can ask. But I'm just keeping. The reason is already it has come. 
the IOP must structure data words from uh, many different uh, sources. This is the way and the things for uh, For example, it may be uh, necessary to take four bytes from the input device and tag them into one thirty-two uh, bit word before the transfer to memory. This is the same link to this. And though this has been discussed earlier, uh, the very first figure, why we need uh, you know that interface unit. Meaning this IOP is capable of uh, uh, upgraded means it is uh, possessing the ability of now interface unit module hardware. The first figure what we have seen, the second uh, the DMA hardware. So and CPU abilities like arithmetic uh, and logical functions are performing. So this IOP is so sophisticated means so advanced. Okay, so the data are gathered in the IOP at the device rate. And uh, bit capacity while the CPU is executing its own program. This also uh, known to you why this uh, you know uh, interface is required. So peripherals may be slower, CPU may be faster. That's why interface unit needs to have some data registers inside so that it can put inside that uh, data register the slower device. This faster device can come and uh, pick them. So like that we discussed, you know, the data rate issues. So that that speed issues, data rate uh, how fast it can transfer. So those are also uh, so capable. So after the input, uh, after the input data are assembled into the memory world, they are transferred from IOP directly into the memory by stealing one memory cycle from the CPU. This is what the thing I convey to you people. That stealing means for a while, Baba, you do it for one nanosecond, you do it, and the, the other na one nanosecond, you just. Keep quiet. I will do the job. That is stealing, stealing one memory cycle. So similarly, an output word transferred from memory to the IOP is directed from the IOP to the output device at the device rate and bit capacity. So with this, uh, these are all uh, you know how many three, three more slides. Here we completed. This three you can uh, let us. Uh, let us look at our, uh, you know, grab this. The communication between the IOP and the devices attached to it is similar to the program control method of transfer communication with the memory. It's similar to the direct memory access method. This is the same again. That's what uh, I just want to skip this. The reason why, because the communication between the IOP and the devices, that is the peripheral devices attached to it is similar to the program control method. This program control method we have seen no earlier, earlier uh, uh, data transfer uh, we have seen no that uh, program control method is there, IO uh, versus memory and memory map method, three methods we have seen. So in that program control method is there no that program control method. Are you remembering guys there any confusion? Program control method. Previously, we have talked about transfer. Three methods are there. One is the program, uh, program the control method. The, the other is uh, I/O versus uh, memory. The, the other is a uh, only memory map. Remembering, guys, there. Remembering. Are no one responding. Someone, someone unmute and respond. We are about to wrap this session quickly. Some, someone unmute and respond. Are you people there? Wait, what happened? Guys, are you people there? Are you no one responding. What happened? Yes, sir. Okay, Are Baba, you can respond to somebody. Is that clear at this point? This point, what I was telling? This program control method. Wait. Someone, someone respond so that I can proceed. And if I simply unmute and tell yes or no, what is the problem? Is that clear? Sir, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Why, what, uh, why then you people are so much hesitating to respond? Are you resting or what? Uh, so that, that's the point here. The way by which the CPU and uh, IOP communicate depends on the level of sophistication. Uh, sophistication. Uh, this is uh, this is the advancement. How how much sophisticated this device? Sophisticated means how much advanced the technology. So 
so the way the way by which the cpu and the io iop communicate depends on the level of advancement included in the system sophistication included in the uh, system sophistication means advancement included in the system so in very large scale computers each processor is independent of all others and any uh, one processor can initiate an operation this is again the same story here that this this, this one this. So who will initiate a somewhere with uh, somewhere let it as similarly with that oh this one the cpu usually assigns the task of initiating the iop program so the same point here in a very large scale computers each processor is independent of all others and any one processor can initiate an operation so that is that is in most computer systems the cpu is the master while iop is the slave processor in most computers this is the, that is what is stealing about uh, who will take over that you know one nanosecond you and the other nanosecond i who will go first so that is actually uh, given the opportunity to decide to the cpu not to the iop so the cpu is assigned the task of initiating all operations but io instructions are executed in the io only so this is also already discussed so let us ramp forward on today's session because again if i take, uh, go this four points the four points will be the same 